So we look at the leading causes of death in the United States. We see two that really stand out, heart disease and cancer. Roughly one-third of deaths are due to heart disease, one-third to cancer, maybe not quite. And everything else accounts for all the other causes of death. So almost 600,000 cases a year of cancer, and the numbers are going to increase as our population ages. Of course, if you watch TV, you listen to the news, whatever, you get a slightly different impression. <laughs> yeah, there's cancer, there's heart disease, and then it's, you know, um, But uh, the reality is that we live in the midst of intersecting crises. We, of course, all know about global climate change. Um, it's um, something that is a real problem that our, our, we collectively, as a society, are going to have to deal with. Um, we're running into all kinds of resource limits, water, energy, and so forth. We have an aging population along with an obesity epidemic, and these twin problems are conspiring to create a huge and rapidly increasing burden of disease for the entire population. And the result of this is that we are facing spiraling health care costs that th they threaten to bankrupt not only our economy, but the global economy. Let's take a look at just one of these for a moment, one that is strongly linked with cancer, and that's obesity. Obesity has been shown, and this is according to the National Cancer Inst Institute, to be associated with an increased risk of cancers of the esophagus, pancreas, and so forth, breast. Um, and um, it's also been associated with the progression of various cancers. So it's not just the development, it's actually a driver of the progression of the cancers once they've gotten hold. Look what's happened to the, the rates of obesity in our country. Here's a map of the United States back in 1985. This is uh, just on the cusp of the introduction of high fructose corn syrup into the American diet. And you see that there are a few states, at this time, it's interesting, those were the, the blue states. The blue states have a different meaning now. Um, but it was the blue states then that had rates of obesity that were over 10% of the population. And obesity is defined as a body mass index, a measure of weight divided by height, where a person is um, over 30, or uh, for a 5 foot, 4 inch person, 30 pounds overweight. So you see, most states had relatively um, low rates, or there wasn't even data because it wasn't even on our radar screen. Now watch what happens year by year, 1986. More and more states are turning blue, dark blue. See the rates, now we have a new bracket, it's now over 15, almost 20% of the population defined as obese in those dark blue states. This is like a, a creeping epidemic. If this were bird flu, people would be running for the exits. So we have a new category now, yellow. That's over 20% of the population. And I'll, Mississippi, trendsetter state, the first state to crack 20, 25%. The emergence of the red states. So this is the last year for which data uh, is available on these maps, which are available through the Centers for Disease Control. And we see that the last time we looked at this, and we mapped it, um, over 30% of the population was obese. And currently, it's nationwide, over 30% and two-thirds of the population are overweight or obese. That means a BMI over 25. And, uh, this is, this is really something that is so strongly linked with diet and nutrition and lifestyle uh, that um, it screams out that we have to do something. What are the main causes? I'm not naming names. As you can see, there's not, no names are printed. You see, no names. Just generic 
foodstuffs. I, see, I think I see some casein in there. <laughs> not naming names. Let's not forget there are also non-dietary factors. So what's the problem with our diets? Well, some people say that it's too many or the wrong kind of fats. Others will argue, no, it's the sugar. It's the sugar or the white flour, the processed foods. Some will say it's too much meat or animal protein. Others, it's the chemicalization of our diets, the additives in our food, the introduction of genetically modified organisms. And yet others will say that it lacks it lacks fiber, it lacks micronutrients, nutritive factors that are missing. You know, it's a little bit like the seven blind men and the elephant. And I would say that the elephant is the standard American diet. And all of these, all of these are aspects of that larger whole. So as a result, we've come to um, think that it's really important to help people to make changes to really move away from the standard American diet toward the whole food plant-based approach that we've heard in some of the lectures today is so important. As we move into this direction, we think that there are five pillars of what we consider to be a really healthy diet. The first is that our diet should be comprised of whole, unrefined, unprocessed foods. So that means that we don't take the, um, the bran and uh, remove it from the endosperm around a whole grain. We eat the entire whole grain, not just the white rice or the white flour. It means that when we eat, when we eat a plant, we eat the roots and the leaves, the leafy greens and the roots, all the edible portions. Second thing is we want our diets to be as much as possible plant-based. Michael Pollan, uh, who wrote a book, very interesting book called The Omnivore's Dilemma, argues that we should eat food. And by that, he means whole, real food, not processed or synthetic food. And he said, food, mostly plants. And I agree. It should be plant-based. A third factor that we think is important is that our diet should be locally grown and in season. Part of rebuilding and, and, and fostering community means supporting community-supported agriculture, developing our own gardens. It means growing our own food, not leaving it to centralized places in far-flung uh, areas of the country or even in other countries where it takes a huge amount of, of fossil fuels to get that food delivered to us. And when we eat in season and locally grown, we eat food that is more evolved for what we need at the time of year that we're eating it. A fourth pillar is that our, we believe that our food should be organically and biodynamically grown. By organically, I mean that it should be grown without the use of pesticides, fertilizers, other kinds of things as much as possible. And by biodynamic, I mean that we should be cultivating a rich soil culture because the nutrients that get into our food are a reflection of what's in the soil to begin with. And we want our food to be sustainably grown as well. And if we require huge turbines that require fossil fuels and then where we ship things in on airplanes, that's not a sustainable approach to agriculture. And finally, fifth, we feel it should be balanced in terms of nutrients. Of course, we've all heard about you know, nutritionally balanced diets. But I would also add in energetically balanced. This is derived from principles from, uh, um, from more traditional healing systems like Chinese medicine and Ayurveda that recognize that there is a life energy that pervades us and that when we are optimally healthy, it's when the factors in that life energy are optimally balanced. And food is a reflection of that. And by choosing food in balance with our own needs, we can help to achieve balance in our own bodies. And then also balance is aesthetic balance. We don't want everything on the plate that we're eating to be colored brown or everything, even everything to be green. We want different colors and we want it to be pleasing to the eyes. The first step in digestion is you look at the food with your eyes. We want it to be pleasing to all of our senses, to our sense of smell, to our sense of taste. We want a balance in the di different textures on the plate. We want balance of the different cooking methods that we use. Not everything is boiled. Not everything is raw. Not everything is baked. 
And we want these, these things, that balance is dynamic. It shifts according to the changing seasons, according to other factors. In the summer, that's a time when we have lighter cooking or more raw food. In the winter, in the winter, that's when we have food. Sorry, you guys couldn't hear me? Okay. Um, in the winter, that's when we want to do deeper cooking to make balance with the colder climate outside. And we're constantly changing in relationship. We make balance by changing the food that we eat to, it's a dynamic balance, not a static balance. So it's constant in response to the changing environment, we change what we eat. So these are some of the principles that we teach in the natural healing and cooking program. We want to help people become liberated to be able to learn how to heal themselves using food as a central element. Now, some would say, oh, brilliant, cold porridge and stale bread again. <laughs> uh, well, okay, that was a laugh line, but, um, uh, but actually food doesn't have to taste like cardboard because it's plant-based. And there are different food groups that we draw from. We would define as the new four food groups. Anybody know the old four food groups? When I was a kid, they taught these. Um, one of them was meat. One of them was dairy. Okay, so that's half of what you're supposed to eat, meat and dairy. And then there was uh, fruits and vegetables. You put those together into a food group. And then there was uh, grains, and I don't think they even had discovered beans. Um, <laughs> Anyway, we think that the, the staple foods are whole grains and vegetables as the primary, and then also reflected on our lunch and dinner plate, uh, breakfast plate, we also want to have uh, side orders of beans and legumes, fruit, seeds, and nuts. This is a different orientation. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to become strict vegans. Some people choose to for ethical or other reasons. And that's perfectly okay as long as they do it in a balanced way. Other people can have, you can still have a little bit of food of animal origin, but it's more at the level of a condiment than a central hunk of meat at the center of your plate. Much more the way it is in Asia and countries and, and areas of the world where rates of cancer are much, much lower than they are in the US. And, and if we use those foods, we want to use not the factory farmed forms of them, but the more organically raised ones. But I don't want to take the focus away from the plant foods, the whole grains, vegetables, beans and legumes, fruits, seeds, and nuts. And if you eat this way, food can be absolutely delicious. It can be pleasing to the eyes, it can be pleasing to the palate. Um, this is one of my favorites. It's a, you know, like a very quick stir-fried uh, Chinese greens with garlic emphasizing the brassica vegetables, which are rich in naturally occurring anti-cancer compounds like endothiocyanate and sulforaphane. The, uh, the allicin, which is in the onion family, the allium family, uh, garlic, onions. What are some of the other members of the onion family? Does anybody know? Yes, scallions. scallions, leeks, good. Shallots, chives, very good. You guys are good. You still need to take the class, but you guys are good. <laughs> so uh, the onion family concentrates selenium, which is uh, a compound, a, a mineral that has antioxidant properties. And populations that have higher naturally occurring intake of selenium have lower cancer rates. It's also important in, uh, immune, pro in immune systems in the body in, in supporting them. Uh, here's a picture of curried vegetables. Uh, in curry, we have a variety of Indian spices. One of them is turmeric. People, I'm sure you've heard of turmeric. Turmeric is uh, uh, an, it's a root in the ginger family, and it has potent anti-inflammatory properties. And we, the more we're learning, we discover that, that inflammation, chronic inflammation, is a step in the progression or the, the promotion and progression of many cancers. And so we feel it's important to spice things up with interesting, it's not just, it doesn't have to be just the foods, although we want to retrain our taste buds to appreciate the taste of the food itself, but it's also finding interesting and pleasing ways to do this. Food should taste good. It should be pleasing to all of the senses.
These are some legumes, beans and legumes. So uh, this is another laugh line. And don't tell me to improve my diet. I eat a carrot. Yeah, right. Um, how many times have I encountered this where somebody um, said to me, uh, well, I did it last week and uh, didn't do anything, so uh, I'm off the hook? Mm hmm Well, that's one of the reasons why we thought it was important to pro help provide structure, because you know, we're all living lives that where we don't have the right information, we get confusing information from the media, uh, and we also don't have the education about what it is we need to do, almost step by step, and the, and the hands-on and um, the experience tasting food and what it's supposed to taste like and learning how to do it. So in this program, which um, uh, Lorraine and I have co-developed here, and we've been teaching for the past year, at um, Casa de Luz, which is a natural um, macrobiotic, vegan, organic, gluten-free restaurant in San Diego. <laughs> Some would say a dining center because it's community-based. There's, and sugar-free, well, that just, what's, what is sugar? Um, that's not a whole food. Uh, and uh, uh, Casa de Luz has an upstairs teaching kitchen where we've been offering the, the class for the past uh, almost a year and we're going to be expanding to other areas of San Diego as well. And in this class, we offer hands-on instruction in plant-based cooking. We teach the use of food as medicine. In other words, this is what Hippocrates was doing. Even, even before uh, Dr. Campbell, there was Hippocrates. <laughs> and um, and uh, we, we teach the use of food as medicine, and the, we teach people not just the how-to, although that's important, but also the why. What is, what is the philosophy that underlies this? It's so liberating to understand you know, why you're doing certain things, so then you can take ownership of it yourself. Yeah, I mean, there are techniques, and we teach those, and they're important. People need skills, they need, they need, that, in, they need that information, but they also need to have an understanding of why it is and how they can apply it in different situations. They also, and this is something we provide, is a soup to nuts meal with each class. So people have a, a sense of what it should look like and what it should taste like. And then as supportive things, we also offer recipes, videos, blogs, other materials. So this is all a very shameless plug for our class. We hope you'll all come. Not all at once, but uh, um, but then again, why change your diet when you can just keep sending me to the Bahamas twice a year? So anyway, that's the Natural Healing and Cooking program. And uh, oh, we have a recipe here. So this is, uh, is this in their uh, Yeah, these are, okay, these are cool. just a couple quick recipes in your, um, in your book. And I'm just going to tell you quickly, and then we're going to let you go to lunch so that we can get back on schedule. Um, so the main thing with rice, I used to get, I used to eat rice growing up. I, kinda, I think I told you guys my parents raised me basically eating rice every single day in the same way. And I got a little bit boring. And um, so I kind of made it my mission in life. Like rice has to be delicious. And it wasn't until I discovered this really kind of neat toasting trick to your rice that makes it pop and just delicious. So I wanted to give you one little trick. So when you, you have to wash your rice um, at least three times until the water runs clear. And then instead of filling the rice and water in your pan, just stir around the rice in the hot pot and let the water evaporate. And you kind of smell this wonderful toasty aroma and then you add the water to your rice and then you cook it. And it's just, to me, it changed my whole experience of rice from someone who grew up on it boiled every single day. Now, yes. Lorraine, are you talking about The rice is washed, so it's wet, and then it's in the hot pan, so then it evaporates, and then it smells. It's not toasted in that it turns brown, so the toasting word is a little misleading, but it toasts in that you smell this delightful, nutty aroma, and um, then you know it's ready, and then you put in the hot water, and it actually cooks more quickly at that point because the rice is nice and hot, and then you bring it to the boil and cook the rice you, as you would normally. Yes? Uh, Lorraine, quick question, though. For all yeah. kinds of brown rices. These Lorraine, in, in this recipe, you said rice. 
Now, I'm going to assume, knowing you, that <laughs> you don't mean white rice. <laughs> Brown rice. Okay. Brown rice, jasmine rice, forbidden Does, rice, wait a minute, purple wait a minute. rice. This is a question for the audience. Heirloom what, rice. Oh. What, is there just one type of brown rice? Oh, you I just gave, gave it away, away the answer. <laughs> is there just one type of brown rice? What kind of brown rice is there? Short, <laughs> medium, and long grain. Very good. Brown basmati. Most brown people basmati. think, like, if you go to an Indian restaurant, that it has to be white. No, there's brown. If you go to a Chinese restaurant, you think white jasmine. No, it can be brown. Mm -hmm. There can Delightful, be. Yeah. There's black brown rice. Right. That's sort of a misnomer. There's red brown rice. <laughs> wild, wild rice. Actually, which is wild actually... rice is not technically a rice, but you can throw that in too. <laughs> and so, so many variety of um, types of rice, and that's why I didn't specify. Um, this is a really good one that actually was inspired by Rusty Kallenberg's wife, who has been in our classes and is going to be teaching them. Um, Rusty is our director of the Center for Integrative Medicine and just really the pioneer. He's going to talk tomorrow a little bit more. But um, she said, oh, I just invented, actually Rusty told me first, she invented this rosemary or this white bean butter. It's so good. And so then I asked Lisa about it and she was telling me a little bit more about it. And um, so we just came up with this recipe the other day. And boy, is it delicious. It's just absolutely fabulous. Yes. <gasps> Thank you. See, we need you. Are you can we hire oh you? My. What are you doing later? <laughs> Thank you. You can tell what's, I did these like in the Lorraine, middle of the night. <laughs> Lorraine, what's the matter you? <laughs> Yes. Oh, thank you. So miso is a delightful um, thing to get to know. We, like, we really wanted to introduce miso in this context because we wanted a chance to talk a little bit about fermented foods. I'll say what miso is and then I'll pass the mic to Dr. Sachs to talk about fermented foods. Miso is a, it can really be any bean or grain I've discovered. It's traditionally made out of soybeans and it's um, fermented and it's a salty, savory paste that is incredibly good for gut health. So we really like incorporating it into our recipes not only for um, the health benefit but it has to taste delicious too. So different misos work well for different contexts. This one we kind of want like a cheesy, savory, light flavor and so the chickpea miso. It's actually a miso instead of using soybeans they use chickpeas, and otherwise known as garbanzo beans, and then those are fermented and quite delicious. So um, that's a very nice miso. You could use white miso for this. Um, there's a darker miso, like a barley miso, that's delicious as soup, but it's a little strong flavor for this kind of, you know, you have such a light, um, delicate white bean flavor that um, it's nice to have more of a mellow miso for this one. And so, why do we like miso? Yeah. So. Uh, you guys have probably heard about active cultures. Like, like yogurt. Usually people think about yogurt. Uh, well, in fact, active cultures, the same ones that are found in yogurt, like lactobacillus and bifidus, are also found in miso. But minus then, the casein, right? <laughs> right, without the, without the casein, without questionable things, without the growth factors that promote the growth of a big baby cow, but are kind of questionable in the context of a fully grown human with a growth disorder like cancer. Kind of makes you wonder a little bit. Uh, but um, in any case, uh, these things also contain compounds like zibicolin, which uh, will help to take industrial toxins and clear them from the body. And then sometimes we'll make miso soup, and the way they do that in Japan, they'll include even some sea vegetables in there like wakame. And some of those sea vegetables in the kelp family contain yet another compound called sodium alginate, which binds heavy metals, including radioactive isotopes of cesium, strontium, and iodine, and clears them from the body. There's a whole literature about the, ra the radiation protective effects of miso and seaweed. Very interesting. Yeah. We're really fortunate at UCSD. We have a student-run free clinic project that Ellen Beck, who's on our executive team of the Center for Integrative Medicine, um, works on. So we're going to be training students to actually run this nutrition and cooking class for underserved audiences through the student-run free clinic project. Um, so that's one resource. And um, I'll let you talk about the Medicare. Well, what I would say is that 
it's going to take some time for our health care policies to catch up with reality. And <laughs> And until then, we're doing our damnedest to keep the cost down. So one way we do that is by offering this education in groups. And what that means is that instead of like, you know, when I see a patient one-on-one, -on -one, it's just them and me, and that's beneficial. It can help to tailor things to their individual need, but a lot of times the questions or the needs it's, it's a whole group of people having that, that need or that interest all at once. So why not teach it in groups? Then we can keep the overall cost down for everybody, and we get the added benefit of a group healing dynamic. People encourage each other in groups. They support each other. They can answer questions and come up with creative ideas for one another. So that helps people to stay with this and to, to get into it and to learn it and to stay with it. Um, another thing is we also have a policy where we will work with anybody to help them financially, you know, if they're strapped, to, to make it affordable for them. We haven't turned anybody away because of financial situations. So that's a policy. And I think, you know, for the average person, um, you know, we serve like a five-course gourmet full-on meal, not even sample sizes. So we're actually probably the lowest cost cooking class that you can find on the market today for what you get. Most cooking classes give you samples. Um, ours is, you know, full-on, plus they get the whole nutrition education side of it, the why. Um, so it's pretty, pretty unique. And, um, and I would add one other thing, Lorraine, and that is that, you know, if you eat at the bottom of the food chain instead of the top, even in spite of the distortion of, of the market that's occurred because of our crazy agricultural policies, it still works out to be cheaper. And the money you save on your grocery bills will pretty quickly help pay for the cost of the class. And if you just pay out of pocket for one CT scan, you could, you could bring your whole family to our class for that. Yeah, your whole community, your whole neighborhood. <laughs> Um, do we have anything else? Oh yeah, so collar drops. This is another great thing. We're trying to get away from some refined products. So how, how can you can do lunches that are quick and easy. Instead of using bread, why not use a collard, a piece of collard. I was going to demonstrate also with cabbage. You can just cook that up and it's nice and floppy and easy to make. This is just a great formula for you to add whatever you like. We have a uh, probably unique ingredient. Maybe many of you have never seen before. Maybe you have. We have a good unique audience here, some of you guys know, is um, umeboshi plum. How many have heard of umi? Oh, wow, I'm impressed. All right, pretty good number. Um, so umeboshi, this is, has to be one of my favorite ingredients. It's sort of like salty and sweet and lemony, and mm, it's so good. So um, if you haven't tried it, you must. It's the perfect it's condiment. You could add it as just a salad dressing. It's better than pretty much any vinegar, but this just adds the perfect complement to any dark green vegetable. But it's not sour and like sort of stinky like vinegar. It's like a nice, more brined, mellow, mellow flavor. So, and why do we like umi? And, and I was also going to say, many years ago, about 30 years ago, when I first chanced upon this whole thing, I ended up uh, living for a year in a macrobiotic house and uh, we sat on the floor on rice mats and we ate with chopsticks and did all kinds of weird things <laughs> and we got introdu introduced to all these Japanese foods. One of them was called umeboshi. It's a fermented food like miso and I discovered that it goes really nicely on sweet corn and I, when I was in medical school I had a classmate whose grand, he was Japanese, Japanese American and his grandparents in Japan, his grandmother made her own umeboshi, but she never put it on sweet corn. I had him over for dinner. He tried it for the first time, and he said, this is the best use of umeboshi I've ever had from his non-Japanese classmate. Right, right, right. It's true, yeah. And it was, corn oh, in the cob back season. then they didn't have GMOs. Right. Corn in the cob season is coming up. I have to say, I've converted so many people with that from, you don't, you'll never even crave butter on your corn again. I know it sounds impossible, but just try it. Take my, and Dr. Zax's word for it, try umeboshi plum on fresh corn on the cob when it's in season, and you will never go back. You will never even think twice about putting butter on it. I, I also want to, I also just want to say a shameless plug for collard greens. Okay, what, <laughs> what family is collard, or collards a member of? The, the, the brassica or cabbage family. Yeah. And what are some of the other vegetables in that family? 
broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, cabbage, water, watercress. Uh, by the way, what is watercress the richest source of? P-E-I-T-C. <laughs> yeah, you've heard of P-E-I-T-C, haven't you? Phenylethyl endothiocyanate? No? Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, what else is in that family? Rapini, cauliflower. There's an amazing array. Brussels sprouts? I love Brussels sprouts, too. Actually, somebody already said them, but you can have my Brussels sprouts. <laughs> I'll share them with you. Anyway, amazing array of anti-cancer compounds found in this family, and when we feed them to mice bearing tumors, we can actually stop tumors from growing. It's amazing. So, um, anyway, I think that probably wraps it up. Bad pun yep. for now, but um, <laughs> come to the cooking demo. Do we have another slide? Do we have another slide? Oops. There we go. So, come to the cooking demo later. Uh, if you want more information about the program, it's available on our website. Stop in the Learning Center for samples, and we'll see you uh, later this afternoon and this evening. Yes.